This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode 24 for March 13th, 2009 on... Friday the 13th, I'm Vincent Racaniello. And I'm Alan Dove. And joining us today in my office in New York is Hamish Young. Welcome to TWIV, Hamish. Thank you very much. Very pleased to be here. Hamish was a colleague of mine here in the Department of Microbiology. He was a professor of microbiology and a virologist. So now we have two virologists and a former virologist, I guess, Alan. That's right. Vince, is the goal eventually to get my entire thesis committee back together again? <laughs> Who was the other person on it? Alan Stahl was what was on it. Alan, Alan Stahl was on it yeah. and uh, Jim Hogle. Jim Hogle. Oh, that, there we are. Right. That would be fun. Yeah, that would be good. That would be fun. I don't know about <laughs> Alan. I, I have no idea where he is, but uh, Jim is still up in Harvard. I'd forgotten that you were on Alan's That's committee. That's right. No, I remember that. So you, you retired how many years ago? Uh, it's now almost four. I retired in July 1st, 2005. So Lucky you. I, <laughs> I missed the downturn. but uh... Well, we're going to have you come regularly to TWIV, so we'll keep you on your virological toes. <laughs> and you can... Oh, this sounds like too much work. <laughs> no, no, you shouldn't have to do any work. You should be able to just talk uh, whatever is in your, in your brain there. Okay. Uh, Hamish used to work on adenoviruses. Right? That's correct. And you were interested in transcription and recombination. That's correct. If I remember. That's so I correct. did listen to your seminars. You did listen to my seminars, right? <laughs> and to my students talking as well. So today we have our usual topics. And one thing I wanted to start out with is that for the last, f yesterday, I was an expert witness at a polio vaccine litigation trial. I've been preparing for this for the last two months, I think. I've been thinking a lot about polio. And yesterday I testified, and I don't want to give any details out yet because uh, the jury is going to be charged next week. There's still some testimony. It's a very interesting experience. And uh, once I'm done, I want to talk about it a bit because it's an interesting aspect of science. And I also want to bring one of the lawyers onto TWIV who I worked with, a very smart guy who's been working on polio vaccine cases for over 30 years. And I think it would be very interesting to hear from him how this whole area has evolved and why there is litigation and so forth. I mean, the bottom line is that when we used to use live polio vaccines in this country, a certain percentage of recipients or contacts of the recipients would get polio from the vaccine. And whether or not that was a good or a bad thing or the issues in these lawsuits. So... Uh, We'll talk about that at, at some point. In the process of preparing for uh, the, this trial, I was reading uh, the regulations. This Code of Federal Regulations has all the rules for preparing and testing polio vaccine, and these are issued by the Food and Drug Administration. It's called the CFR. So in that, it tells you how to grow the virus vaccine and how to test it. One of the um, things I came across, which I thought was really interesting, um, I was reading the regulation, and they said, each seed virus used for vaccine manufacture shall be prepared from an acceptable strain in monkey kidney cell cultures derived from animals or in a cell culture of a type determined to be suitable. The seed virus used in ma vaccine manufacture shall be demonstrated to be free of extraneous microbial agents except for the unavoidable bacteriophage. Huh. How about that? Unavoidable bacteriophage. What do you think of that? Do either of you have any idea what that refers to. The unavoidable bacteriophage, besides being a potentially good name for a band, I'm not sure. <laughs> it is a good name. Well, if you remember, Alan, uh, were you here on TWIV when uh, Max Gottesman? Yes, I was. So you remember he talked about there being phages in, in calf serum? Right. So this is it. When you grow the virus, <sighs> you have calf serum. And you can't filter it out, of course. Right. Yeah. And you can't sterilize it because you can't destroy right. the things in the serum. Exactly. You can't heat the, the, the serum, right? So you have phage in your virus vaccine. Which comes from fecal material from the cow. I came across a 1975 science article by none other than Gina Colata. Really? The, the, the Times science correspondent. 
So this is fetal calf serum. Right. So they used to get it from slaughterhouses when they would right. kill the cows right. for meat. Right. There would be fetuses all over right. on the floor, right. which they would then pick up and, and take the serum right. out of. So apparently they would get contamination with fecal yes. matter and so forth. And then I suppose the bacteria would get in the serum and they would perhaps lice before it was filtered. Yes. And so the yes. phage get in the serum, it's filtered. In the or, there are, or there are lysates already in the fecal material. It could be, yeah. There are already phages in the fecal material. Yeah, either way, it's contamination. Yes, it's contamination. Right. Now, Max at Gottesman had told us that the way phages get into serum is when the cows eat grass, they get a little dirt which has phages and bacteria mm -hmm. that are lysogenic, mm -hmm. which we thought was a good explanation mm -hmm. at the time. But I, I don't know uh, how the phages would get from the gut into the bloodstream. Right, that's usually a pretty good barrier. Yeah, I would. I think it has to be contamination from the slaughterhouse yeah, floor. Slaughterhouse. Right, right. So I don't know nowadays whether they still get fetal calf serum in the same way or not. You know, whether it's a slaughterhouse or whether they are herds bred specifically for uh, making serum. Well, I know that the the rules for fetal serum have become much more strict over the years. So, for example, uh, sourcing of the fetal material is much more important than it used to be. Because I remember when I was ordering fetal calf serum, High Clone would make a very big deal about how this came from a certified herd and so on and so forth. I think I've got that right. My memory isn't perfect on these issues, obviously. Um, but I, uh, there used to be sort of bootleg fetal serum that you could get, which was much cheaper. And that used to be, this is before the days of mad cow disease, of course, that, that put also a, a huge restriction on the sources of a lot of this stuff, because people were worried about, you know, contamination and people handling it and so on and so forth. I mean, there were all sorts of worries, some of which were probably worthless worries, but nevertheless were mm. there. So the, so the issue of, of sourcing fetal calf serum became a much greater issue after the mad cow disease outbreak. So it could be that today the, these, the live viral vaccines that we make, which include measles, mumps, rubella, yellow fever, the new rotavirus vaccine, they're all live. They, maybe they're grown in, in serum that's free of phages. Well, I don't, I haven't followed this, but but how advanced are serum-free media now? Yeah, right. That's the other possibility, I mean, it, it, sure. It, you right. know, it could be that, that the, I mean, they were never as effective as, as fetal calf serum back in the day, but I would imagine there's been a lot of effort to try to get that. Well, you realize what's going to happen now. Somebody's going to uh, going to do a small and somewhat fudged clinical trial to prove that uh, bacteriophage is causing autism. Yeah, I was going to say, I shouldn't laugh, but that, yeah, that's, yeah that's unfortunately, <laughs> that's, you know, well, you know, correlation it, and causation, we have the right. same problem. When again, this, right? when this was, this contamination was first detected around 1975, there was quite a debate about this, mm -hmm. whether the mm -hmm. phages were doing something to people. Yes. And many, many doses of live vaccine have been used globally, of course. Right, right. And the, the issue was that nobody keeps records to see if there are any specific diseases that right. might be caused by this. So there was a bit of a furor which seems to have died down. I don't know if it's because they have serum without phages or, as you said, they don't. They have serum-free medium. Uh, you could say that maybe uh, phages do something, who knows, but they don't replicate in mm -hmm. human cells, as far as we know. Right. Anyway, I thought that was interesting. <laughs> never the seen unavoidable phages. phages. So apparently the, um, they found there were phages in these vaccines and the FDA didn't know what to do, so they put into the regulations unavoidable because a lot of these lawsuits have to do with if something happens that's not in the regulation, you can get sued. The government can get sued. And that's what happened in the 60s with polio. So they have to change the regulations. The judge in one of the landmark cases says, it's okay to change the regulations, but you got to put it into law. You have to put it in the Code mm -hmm. of Federal mm -hmm. Regulations. They put it in that you could have bacteriophage in vaccines. Uh, I found a story this week called The Prevalence of Enteroviral Capsid Protein VP1 Immunostaining in pancreatic islets in uh -huh. human type 1 yes. diabetes. Yes. So yes. this is a paper in a journal that I don't usually read, Diabetologica. Di Diabetologica, yes. No, Diabetologia. Yeah. Gia. Right. So basically what they did here, you know, there's a long history of people thinking that viruses have mm -hmm. a role in mm -hmm. diabetes, both type 1 and type 2, the type 1 being when you don't make insulin. Yeah, you kill the, the, the beta cells, the right. pancreas. And the type 2 where you don't respond to it, right? That, I think that's correct. Yeah. 
Right. So in this study, they have they have pathology samples. Pathology. From These Glasgow, are people who from, died from Glasgow. Is this from Glasgow? Yeah, it's a Glasgow pathologist, I think. Department of Pathology, Royal Infirmary, Glasgow. That's correct. It made big news in the BBC, which I follow avidly now that I'm retired. Ah. So I followed. I saw this article. I saw the uh, the, the the news report of this article. Huh. Yeah. So shows. Uh, we want to may I make a comment? Of course. Um, it shows the advantages of storing pathological material for long periods of time. And we've seen this a number of times now with the resurrection of the uh, 1918 influenza right. virus, for example. You know, when, when one comes to clear out one's lab, which mm. in my case is still not fully done, uh, you always wonder about whether throwing things away is a wise thing. Yeah, because yeah. this is an example of somebody holding on to or a, an institution holding on to pathological samples. Anyway, that's... A, no, it's a good point because we all have big collections of viruses. Exactly. And I, right. I'm thinking of throwing out all the polio yeah. viruses yeah. because I'm going to have to destroy them at right. some point right. anyway. Right. But it's quite a nice collection. Right. You would think yeah, right. that maybe there should be a place to, yeah. to put all these things. Uh, so yeah, they had... Uh, 172 uh, samples from people with type 1 diabetes in this study and 161 controls. And they were paraffin-embedded pancreatic autopsy samples. Right. It's a right. beautiful resource, yes, right. right? So they just went and stained them with antibodies. They got a, Actually, these are two commercially available antibodies to VP1, one of the capsid proteins. Mm -hmm. And they will detect all enteroviruses, mm -hmm. polio, coxsackie, echo, hmm. other enteros. So it's a common epitope among all these. Yeah, yeah. it's a shared epitope, which yeah. has been shown by these companies. And they're sold for diagnostic mm -hmm. purposes. Mm -hmm. They stained these sections with them. And what they found was that 44 out of 72 of the samples from type 1 diabetic patients stained with mm -hmm. the antibodies, mm -hmm. in, specifically uh, in the insulin-containing beta cells. Beta cells, right. Right. And the controls, only three in, uh, out of 50 neonatal and pediatric normal controls stained. Mm -hmm. So it looks pretty specific. The interesting thing is they also got staining in some 10 out of 25 type 2 diabetic patients. Right. So it's it's almost, uh, it's kind of a, a roughly similar proportion of the type 2s seem right. to be having this. Which made me wonder, you know, are we are we looking at a case where you have type 1 diabetes being caused by the virus or does the diabetes does both do both kinds of diabetes simply make the pancreas more permeable to virus well that's a good question this study doesn't answer that question right right, right. but it's it's certainly an interesting uh, very interesting thing to look at i think this is the best among the best data yeah. i've seen so yeah. far yeah. on this yeah. everything has been sort of most of the previous data has been done with live living samples and they're limited right. in what they can do right with this one of the things you can do now is look all over the world at specimens right. like this and see if right. it's consistent Right. Did they identify which enterovirus was responsible? The, the reason I ask that is the BBC said, well, of course, now are the chances to get a vaccine, you know, in its enthusiasm for, for this, this report. And, of course, you need to know what the virus yeah, no is. Virus. No, they didn't right. do that. They didn't do that. But so. that's, that's what you could do next. Next, yeah. So, so did the, the, in the report, they don't go into trying to type. No. Not at all. They only use these two pan-entero antibodies. But that's a good point because the next thing, right, is you'd want to identify which specific one. Right. And then, I guess, you would do big epidemiological studies. Exactly, because there must yeah. be large pools of, of serum, not pools, but uh, um, collections of serum from all yeah. sorts of patients uh, to see whether prevalence of antibodies to this particular exactly. virus Exactly, yeah. So, so that's the sequence, right? right? Then you do epidemiology, and then that will tell you which... right. Right. It could be more than one because sure. if, for, if it's an autoimmune right. uh, disease, which people believe it diabetes is, right. is right. it could be more than one, in which case you'd have to find that from the epi and then could make right. your vaccines. Right. Maybe maybe we could have an enterovirus vaccine. You know, right. I always teach the students, you know, there are lots of these enteros that are medically <laughs> relevant, but there's so few. Sure. Right. Well, actually, this, but this this suggests that there is a there is a there's a common epitope. Mm -hmm. Then and the companies have. Uh, so why can't we make a vaccine? Can't, why can't we make a vaccine? I mean, why has it not been tested mm -hmm. in model systems to see whether this is protective? Maybe it's been done. Yeah. Uh, well, that could be that it's not a protective epitope. It's not yeah. protective. I just don't. I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. Looking at this, it doesn't say. But it's an interesting question. I, I suspect if it were protective, you would see a vaccine. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Although vaccine. The economic cards are stacked against vaccine makers. So 
yeah, it's not a it's not a good business. To it's be not in. a good business to be in. So you know, this this is something that might be languishing out there because no no pharmaceutical company wants to touch touch it with a ten foot pole. Yeah. I think it's a good start. You know, mm. if you can narrow it down and do some good epidemiology, if you can say millions of people get diabetes from this infection, right. then that's oh, no, compelling. That, oh, that's compelling. That's and very economically compelling. as well yes. as as medically. Yes. Right? So you yes. heard that on the BBC. That's oh yes, yeah. The BBC the BBC had a uh, well because you know they're always. You're from uh, Glasgow originally? Well, no, I, I grew up not far from Glasgow, and of course I did my early virological training in Glasgow mm-hmm. at the Institute of Virology. With whom? Uh, with Jim Williams, oh. as a, one of the early pioneers of adenovirus genetics. Well, sometime we'll, we'll have you back to tell us about yes. the early days. Yeah, yes, the early days. Right. <laughs> one, thing, one thing people have, no, have told us is they like to hear from uh, people who have been around a while the, what, how things The used old to geezers. Be. Right? The, imp- the implication <laughs> is we'll soon be gone. And, <laughs> <laughs> we yes. have to be recorded <laughs> into posterity. But all right, the next interesting article is um, one on what are called Henipa viruses, Hendra and Nipa virus. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. This is a paper from a group here. Uh, it's an Aust- collaboration right, between Australia, Australia right. and here in, in New York. And the, the lead author is Anne Moscona, who's a paramyxovirus yes. person. And this is called Stimu- Simulating Henipa Virus Multicycle Replication in a Screening Assay Leads to Identification of a Promising Candidate for Therapy. So I thought this was interesting uh, because these are two viruses, Nipah and Hendra, which are paramyxoviruses. We've talked about these uh, before on TWIV, two paramyxoviruses who, which have caused zoonoses very recently in humans. And Hendra was first from a horse in Australia. And in fact, Hendra is a suburb of Brisbane. And this was an outbreak of uh, neurologic disease in horses and humans. So the virus... And highly uh, fatal. I mean, highly I fatal, that. serious problem. It's not, there are not a lot of infections, but serious enough. And as we know, these zoonoses tend to, to build over the years. The other one is Nipah, which originally came from an outbreak of, again, encephalitis, respiratory illness in Malaysia and Singapore among pig farmers. Right. And the idea in both is that the virus actually, the reservoir is bats, right. and fruit bats, fruit bats particularly. Right. And it goes into horses or All pigs, pigs right. and then the people who work with the horses or pigs get sick. Right. And in fact, in this article, they mentioned that last year, a person who worked uh, in a raceway, a yeah. horse park, right. got very sick and died, despite right. having very good medical care. Right. So there's in some, Australia. And so there's some need to have some antivirals. And of course, these are very dangerous viruses to work with. So it's not easy to screen for antivirals because you have to grow them, right? So what they did here is clever. They made pseudotypes. And what they did basically is they take vesicular stomatitis virus and they take all the genes you need to make VSV except the glycoprotein. So if you express all the VSV genes in cells, you get particles that don't have glycoproteins on them. They're not infectious, of course, but then you can substitute in a glycoprotein of any other envelope virus, pretty right. much, and make a pseudotype. So they made Hendra and Nipa with two two glycoproteins from these viruses: the the attachment protein, the H, and the um, fusion protein, right. the F protein. F protein. So they may now make these VSV particles with all the uh, glycoproteins of these Henipa viruses on the surface, and then they take it one step further. So they have these pseudotyped viruses, and then they infect cells that that express the Henipa glycoproteins on the cell surface so they can get not only infection but production of new virions and they can check the infectivity of those virions. Okay, so you can look at not only entry but exit or production of infectious virus. And these VSV pseudotypes with the henipavirus glycoproteins, they have a red fluorescent protein. So this is how they can assay Nobody looks at infectivity anymore. anymore right? <laughs> <laughs> they look at fluorescence. You right. have expensive equipment. You look at fluorescence. And, they, and then they basically adapted this to a high throughput kind of assay where they could look at many, many chemicals mm-hmm. and see which mm-hmm. one inhibits the virus. So they went through a bunch of chemicals and they found one that's already been approved for use in humans, and that's chloroquine. Amazing. Isn't yeah, that amazing? Yeah. It inhibits the production of these pseudotypes in this assay. They found a couple of others, but they decided to pursue chloroquine because it's approved right. for malaria. Right. And that, I thought Dick would get a kick out of that, but he's not here. <laughs> chloroquine has been approved. It's safe. And these, these, the inhibition of these pseudotypes is lower uh, than the plasma concentrations in people who are getting chloroquine treatment for malaria. And they think the mechanism of action is that uh, this this chloroquine inhibits the processing of the glycoproteins right. as they're right. coming out of the cell, which I found uh, interesting because I remember chloroquine is inhibiting endosomal 
Yes, yeah, so I thought it would be the other way around. Right. So I, I thought, thought it would be the other way around. Uh, yes, entry. Yes, mm -hmm. right. I would have thought that too. It was sort of similar to some of the effects of like amantadine on the way in of ammonium chloride. Uh, yes, ammonium one. chloride, yeah. right? Those, those sort. Baphylomycin. Right. Alan, you may remember these issues because this was part of what your thesis was on. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yes, when I was doing the entry assays. Yeah. It's interesting. This um, one of the things that jumped out at me with this paper is uh, I've seen a number of these sorts of things where um, academic labs are now using this high throughput screening strategy that used to be something that was too expensive for anybody in academia to use, but it's been the kind of the dominant approach in industry for about the past 10 years um, for screening drugs. Now, of course, because of all that, the equipment has come down in price, and so academic researchers can now get a hold of these robots, um, these robotic labs. And one of the important things, of course, is that you have to have an assay that can be automated, which I presume is one of the reasons they used a, a luminescent assay. Right, right. Right. But then once you have your assay set up, if you've got you know, this, this sort of equipment, and a lot of the big research centers now do, you can then take a panel of compounds, you know, thousands essentially, of compounds. Essentially, essentially infinite them. number of compounds, right? Right. Yeah. So the strategy a lot of people take initially is they'll take their pre-made libraries of, of all approved, all FDA approved drugs. Mm -hmm. So you can get a set of samples that's, you know, thousands of little test tubes, each with a little bit of of every, of every drug that's been approved or ever been approved by the FDA, which is presumably the sort of thing they did here. I don't think chloroquine was an accident. I think they probably screened mm. a, yeah. a library of approved drugs and that popped out. And you can also get more exotic libraries, but that's certainly one of the first things to try because, you know, obviously if you get something that's already an approved drug, you're halfway done. Right, hmm. right. Yeah, this was done in collaboration with the High Throughput Screening Resource Center at Rockefeller. Right, So. Yes. Typically, institutions yeah. won't have more, more than one of these. Yes, yes. I, th I believe there's one here at Columbia right. as well. So it has come down in price that we can do it, but you don't want to have one in your lab yet. Although maybe in the future you might. But the libraries themselves are rather expensive. None of it's trivial. This is approved for malaria. So I asked someone who does drug approvals, and I said, well, if it's already approved for malaria, if you wanted to use it for an antiviral, would you have to do a clinical trial? And the answer, of course, is yes. If you want to, uh, on the package insert, if you wanted to yes. say, indicated for use in malaria and Henipa virus, you have to do a clinical trial. But if you want to just prescribe it, if you're a physician, you can. That's right. And you, you, could, know, you pretend the patient has malaria? How does that no, work? No, no. There's, yeah. a, there's something called uh, off-label prescription. In fact, there's... Um, oh, that's, that's, that's being abused, isn't it? This is well, a big fuss so what happens this. is a doctor, a, a licensed physician can prescribe pretty much any drug for pretty much any use. I mean, it's it's up to them they're, to use they're, their they're professional, judgment. Pro professional judgment. Right. Yes. In, if in their professional judgment, this would be a good thing to do. Now, obviously, you get into some liability issues if you're, you know, right. prescribing something that's completely wacky. Right. But if you're prescribing something where there's a body of research that shows... Safety. Is, that Right. It shows it's safe and it may work, you know, as long as it's legally defensible, then that's a perfectly acceptable thing to do. And it's done routinely. But what happens is the drug companies can't advertise or oh, advocate that's what it was. that use yes, in any way. Yes, that's, that's, that's where the legal, tu there was a legal tussle right. recently about that. Yes, right, I that's saw what's that. been abused by a lot of pharma companies where their sales staff will go and sort of quietly say, oh, you know, and you can use it for this, even though it's not approved for that, and they're not supposed to be saying, saying that. Saying that, yes. Okay, that's what I'm, that's what I'm picking up on the illegality. Right. <laughs> Apparently, if you, uh, if there's a published study which says it's good for inhibiting viruses and you could prescribe it. Yes. And I, yeah. my contact tells me it, the physician is not liable if it's been published. Yes. That it if can it's be, been published, right. Yeah. Yes. So I've now, actually, let's say there was an adverse reaction. I think they're not liable. They're not liable. Well, at, at some level, they can probably be liable. <laughs> yeah, they're always liable, right? Yes, no matter exactly. what. Mm -hmm. It's always. Yeah. Even if you sign a non-liability <laughs> yes. treatment, I'm sure they will do. Someone will do a clinical trial mm -hmm. with this and mm -hmm. see. Because it would be nice to have a drug in case you have a little outbreak. I mean, or would, would they have to do animal studies first, or would they go straight to humans? Because I mean, humans are so rare. How can you do a clinical trial an, on this? Or I think for an additional indication, there's an abbreviated process where you don't have to go through the. The animal quite phase. The same, yeah, quite yes. the same set of stages. Well, yes. um, I think Hamish wants to know, how would you show efficacy? Because well, we've got you oh, know, right, one, you, one right. track worker in 10 yeah. years isn't going to do no, it. No, that's a good right. question. Is it possible that this works against, against other paramyxoviruses, or is it just the Henipa group? 
they they actually mentioned something uh, in, in the discussion, which because is because Sendai that. and things of that kind, you could validate be, it with you, those. Could, we could, we, that's yeah. you know that's all over the place. So here's what they say here. Other emerging pathogens, including Ebola, also require. So, cathepsin L is the target of chloroquine, uh -huh. and that's the protease needed to cleave the glycoprotein. So, the Ebola and SARS require cathepsin. So, it could be that. Oh, yeah. So, that and, and they, they, so they say chloroquine was shown to inhibit SARS infection in vitro. Huh. So, oh, um, so there's, there's a, it may be oh, in other okay. paramyxos. But, right. yeah, Sendai, you could do a <laughs> mouse that, model. That yeah. raises an issue. I haven't seen anything in the popular press about SARS mm -hmm. recently. Has it disappeared completely? Well, or is there still <laughs> anything going on? Well, there isn't anything in humans. Uh -huh. I, I haven't seen anything. Have you, Alan? No. Um, but these these sorts of things go in news cycles. Well, that's what I'm wondering. Yes, I mean, I'm wondering if it's actually happening, you know, where there are occasional human cases of SARS. There could be, there could be occasional human cases. I, I, don't, I haven't been um, keeping up with ProMed, but yes. I assume... You know, some of the case reports might make it to there if they're in a place that actually is keeping on top of it. Yes, yeah, I haven't seen any. Yeah, you know, there there could be occasional human cases. The I think the news coverage issue is once a topic has been in the headlines for a month or more, it gets tired. Right, of course. But you know, there's also there's also the 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 eager beaver reporter who who wants to resurrect a sort of instant fame by saying this is back you know right um and that sure. I, I haven't sure. seen any of that well it's that, certainly still in um in, animals. in fruit bats right, which right, is probably right, the source right, of all, right, the, right. <laughs> all viral infections <laughs> all right. fruit bats are bad <laughs> so one solution to this is just to kill all the fruit bats right <laughs> well, we actually mentioned that once uh, when Dick was here, and he said they're the twenty percent of all mammals are, are fruit or bats. Are bats, right? Right. A really right, right, high right. fraction, so that would be hard. Right. It's not nice to to uh, eradicate a species. No, just, of course not. No, I, I'm being facetious. Particular, particularly a species that's got some some purposes in yeah. life. <laughs> what would be good would be to, to understand why yes. they can be infected yes. without yes. disease. Yes. And yes. then yes. translate that into. Well, of course, people. poor bats are having their own problems with epidemic disease yes. at the moment. Mm -hmm. So we should be sympathetic to our other species. You know, it's funny you say poor bats, you know. I, I wonder how many people out there would feel sympathetic to bats. I spend the summers in Nova Scotia. One of the things that we always like to see are the, is the resident bat population, yeah. keeping the mosquitoes at bay. Mosquitoes, so, yes. <laughs> so I'm always very in favor of bats. No, I, I love watching them at dusk flying it's around. Marvelous, it's marvelous creatures. Now, mosquitoes are a species I don't think anybody would miss. No, no, I think you're right. Except a few entomologists. Right. Some, some. Yeah. Well, the whole the whole idea of eradicating a species is a bit. Yes. Well, a, what is it? The guinea worm is the. the guinea is worm it, is on its way. Right? On its way. Right. Has it so, been? Or it's I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, the guinea worm. Well, I mean, this <laughs> argument came up, of course, with uh, with uh, smallpox, didn't it? How how dare we eradicate? <laughs> Well, actually, I was on a podcast with Peter Palazzi, another yeah. a different uh -huh. podcast uh -huh. from this one, and uh, we asked him, "Should we destroy the last bits of smallpox?" He said, "No." He said, "You should keep all viruses because you never know uh, whether they're going to be useful for studying." Yeah. So I think I probably agree with that. And you know, the thing with I smallpox, used not to. I used not to. I used to be of the get rid of it. Get rid of it. Yeah. That, that this was a scourge that we could then relegate to history. But I, I I've changed my mind mm. since then. I think I agree with Peter. Before we go on to our main topic for today, uh, let's have a brief message from the American Society for Microbiology. On May 17th through the 21st at the Pennsylvania Convention Center in Philadelphia, the American Society for Microbiology will hold its 109th general meeting, the largest annual gathering of microbiologists in the world. Visit the general meeting website at gm.asm.org to view the preliminary program, register for the meeting, or reserve your hotel stay. That's gm.asm.org. And now it's time for... Viroids! Why did I decide to do viroids? Last week we did what we call extreme virology, the biggest mm -hmm. and the smallest mm -hmm. viruses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Smallest virus are circoviruses, which mm -hmm. have a 1.2 right. kb right. genome. I forgot to mention viroids, which the smallest of which is a 220 nucleotide RNA. Right. right. So I said, we're going to do viroids because I haven't actually thought about viroids for a long time, and they're fascinating. You remember viroids? Oh, yes, I do. Yes, I do. Yes. I mean, I, I never studied them, but uh, I used to teach... 
when I taught medical and dental students, uh, we went through the classification of viruses and we always ended up with viroids and prions because it seemed to me that these things might be important in the future. And of course, hepatitis D is a sort of viroid-like thing. And of course, they all sniggered when I said, you know, viroids are uh, pathogens of plants and they they were sort of muttering and reading of the New York Times at that point. <laughs> um, but it figured that it was you know, important that yeah. they should know about these yeah. things. No, it's, uh, they're fascinating. And you're right. Most of, them, most of the ones we know of are plant pathogens. And they're small, 220 nucleotides, not more than a few hundred nucleotides. They're typically uh, single-stranded RNAs that fold into a rod-like right, right, structure. Right, right. They have a lot of secondary structure. And then there's the one human one, delta, hepatitis delta, which we'll talk about. But... They are pathogens of crop plants. <laughs> the first one discovered was, I think, potato spindle tuber viroid. Right. It's 1971 by T.O. Diener. Diener, yes. In Theodore, Maryland. Theodore Diener, right. And that causes a disease of potatoes. And there are many others with great names like citrus exocortis viroid, avocado sunblotch viroid. Or is it viroid or viroid? Viroid, I guess. I right? say viroid because I say virus, but I, I don't know. <clears throat> yeah, I, 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 I don't know what T.O. Diener said. What yeah. do you, what's the, the, the pronunciation you hear, Alan? Viroid? I. I guess viroid is the most yeah. common. All right. yeah. The coolest thing I think about uh, these is that they don't code for, except for hepatitis delta, they don't code for any proteins. Mm-hmm. And for many years, nobody understood that. How could these, and they actually cause disease. If you look at the leaves of plants, they have blotches, they stunt the plants. And- One of the most dramatic ones, I think, is, is infects palm trees and causes mm-hmm. the crown of the palm tree to fall off. Really? I mean, it's, it, if I remember correctly, um, that's, yeah. that's one of them. How do they do this? without encoding a protein. So these are RNAs that are copied in the host by RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase 2. Right. Who would have thought? Which in the host copies DNA yeah. templates, right? <laughs> yeah. And we always wondered, hmm, wonder what it could be because we don't know of anything in a, in a host that can copy RNA right. into RNA. Right. Well, in fact, there was a Nature paper not too long ago which showed that hepatitis delta RNA mm. can be copied by Paul too. Yeah, All these things, amazing. these plant cells, these things go in the nucleus and they get copied. They do a rolling circle. A single strand peels off and makes new genomes. And, you know, some of these have ribozymes in them so that they can cleave the new newly produced transcript. There are two questions I thought we could chat about. Uh, one is how they cause disease and the other is how do they spread? Do you, do you remember how they spread? And I always assumed that it was due to either insect transmission mm-hmm. or abrasion. I mean, most plant viruses, as I remember, require some damage to the plant to get in. And that damage can either be abrasion. Right. So one leaf rubs across another and causes damage to the surface of the leaf so that it gets in through a stoma or so it gets, it gets in some way through damage or through uh, insect transmission. This review I have, it says, unlike most plant viruses, they do not have important natural vectors from the animal kingdom. Right, right. There are some that actually get packaged by viral capsids. Mm-hmm. They're, sort of like the hepatitis delta yeah. story. They're associated with viruses, and then in that case, insects mm-hmm. can mm-hmm. transmit them. But I, I, re- I remember reading that many seeds are contaminated with them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you plant the seed, and then all your right. plants, right. when you uh, either in soil, and when as soon as you, you you plant, then they go into the root system. And then when you prune, what, what do you call it when you cut a branch off and you plant it to make oh, a new plant? Um, grafting. 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 So yes. it goes with the graft. You know? the graft there are many. Right. There are many crops. I think grapes for wine. They do mm-hmm. that. They mm-hmm. cut off a. A yeah. branch, and they plant they're, they're it. So of course, then you continue rose the bushes, infection. Rose bushes, rose bushes as right, well. Right. And if it's contaminated, do you have a corrupted graft? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Alan hasn't changed. Right? No, he hasn't. No, he hasn't. <laughs> <laughs> do you do stand up as well, Alan? I mean, uh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> he does sit down, though. Yes, I'm mostly I'm mostly seated. Yeah, I was reading this article where they said you have to make sure your seeds are clean and so forth. So those are the ways it spreads. And then it, the thing that we have to remember is this is mostly RNA. It's naked RNA, mm-hmm. and which normally would be very unstable. But mm-hmm. I presume because it has this rod-like structure, it's double-stranded, right. it's pretty resistant. Right. And then, of course, there's this issue of how does it make the plant sick? Do you know about this, Hamish? I don't know. And you said something in your um, uh, agenda for the day that it might be some version of, of uh, interfering RNA. And that's, I, I didn't know any of this. So I'm, yeah, I'm this is compl- pretty new. Do you know yeah. this story, uh, Alan, at all? Uh, I know the Cerna story. I don't know the viroid part of it, but it's certainly 
this sounds like a reasonable mechanism. Yeah, I mean, these guys go in and they siRNAs are produced from the genomes. Right, right, right. They're recognized by the plant. The plant would like to get rid of them. Right. So their genomes get chopped up by a dicer. Dicer, right. right. And they they're loaded into risks. Right. And right. the idea is that they're complementary to cellular messengers. Right. And of they shut down the host. Yes. Yeah. So stop <laughs> translation or right. whatever. Right. The exact process, I don't think, has been. Specified. Which is what biotech companies were trying to do with antisense <laughs> a decade ago, but that's it turns right. out it, yeah. it happens naturally. And right, know. right. I, I find that amazing because I was always so critical of antisense, and now it, it turns out it's perfect and it works, and it's been there for years and right. years. Yeah. You know, I think one of the things when I was thinking about this on the way up here on the subway is there's two things. One is that viruses continue, or in this case, viroids continue to show you that studying viruses and virology lead you to a humbleness in certitude. Because who would have ever thought that RNA polymerase 2 would be an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase? That isn't, wasn't even on the radar screens yeah, of our thought yeah. process. It's like using tRNA to prime uh, retroviruses. Right. Who would have ever thought a translation factor would be used as a... Yeah. It just shows you that evolution will use whatever it can to achieve a particular... Now, it's, you have to... You never should say it's impossible exactly, in science. Exactly, right? exactly. I mean, it's, a, it's an object lesson. You know, I used to tell the medical students, remember the difference between DNA-dependent RNA polymerase and RNA-dependent mm -hmm. RNA polymerase. And here we've got the damn thing doing both. <laughs> no, that's a good point. But I, unfortunately, I always forget it. I always say, oh, I can't do this experiment. And I have to remember, nothing is impossible. Yes. <laughs> uh, that's it. So this brings us to a medically relevant viroid, or I mean, hepatitis delta is viroid-like. Yeah, yeah. It is packaged by the coat of hepatitis B virus because the delta genome, which is also a, a circular RNA, only encodes two proteins from a single open reading frame called hepatitis right. delta, but neither one is a capsid protein, so it has to be complemented. And this is also a rod-like structure, like the plant viroids. I learned about this when I was a student years ago. That So you have to be co-infected with hepatitis delta and hep B in order to make right. more, more delta particles. And the idea was that it made hep B hepatitis worse. I've heard things over the years that haven't supported this, so I don't know what the status of that is. You probably remember that. Yes, oh, sure. I mean, it was always thought to be the case that it was hep, hep D was a, was a much worse prognosis. About 20 million people thought to be infected worldwide, Mediterranean countries, sub-Saharan Africa, Middle East. And I read recently it's, being, it's coming back into Europe. So the screening of the blood supply for Hep B had eliminated much of the mm -hmm. Delta. But now you have people come moving into Europe from other areas where the screening isn't as good. So now the Delta incidence is going up. So it's really interesting. Now, this is another one where it uses host RNA polymerase too. And this is the one which has been shown in the Nature paper I mentioned some time ago. Right. These delta antigens have different roles in infection. The, the, the delta S and L, one of them is required for replication. So I guess the assumption is that it must do something with, uh, with Paul II. Paul II. And the other one is needed for assembly with the Hep B uh, capsid. So it's quite an amazing little little protein. This uh, delta antigen, not very long. It is 195 amino acids. Is a ribozyme in the delta genome also? That's used actually in. Yes. The, uh, uh, yes. That's that's the ribozyme that's used by many of these um, automatic uh, siRNA vectors, isn't it? As yeah, I you put a delta ribozyme and it will cleave itself. Right. Right. So if, if you get, want to have, so you get the right, you got to get the right. Uh, exactly. Uh, yeah. Uh, and this is, this has been crystallized. We know exactly its structure and sort of how it works. Quite a famous ribozyme. That's right. So that's the delta hepatitis delta. I guess it's called a viral satellite because it needs hepatitis B, but um, it, it looks a lot like a viroid too. Right. So what do you think? Do you think there are more human viroids? Well, never say never, yeah, but it's just been say a long. Yes, you'd be right. <laughs> <laughs> but it's been an awful long time since delta. Yeah, but um, I bet they are in animals, though, and it's just waiting yeah, to come into people. Yeah. They have to be viroids in animals. Oh, you mean you mean the, the, of the not of the hepatitis delta type, but of the plant-like type or any yeah, type? Yeah, either. I would think it's if you were a betting man, you'd probably have to go for it. I would think. Yeah, I, I think you just have to look for it. Right. The problem is, I, I've become more and more convinced in the last ten years that we should be looking in animals for new viruses. Yes, because there's a yes. huge amount to be found yes. there, but uh, it's not something that NIH likes to do. Right, it's right, kind of a, right. a fishing expedition. Right, right. <laughs> but right. I'm sure there's a there's a ton 
of all kinds. Well, again, you know, it's one of those things where the technology is now available to do a lot of this relatively cheaply. So if you are set up to do as um, Ian Lipkin's group is set up to do, to look for infectious agents causing, you know, some disease X, it isn't difficult to adapt that kind of technology, it seems to me, right. to look at wild populations and say, yeah. is there something funny out there? So I think that I think that it's, it is a fishing expedition, but we do a lot of those now, and it could be adapted to to the yeah. to the zoonotic world. Part of this economic stimulus is um, to give to release some money for risky experiments. Right. So one of the things I'd like to do is look for rhinoviruses in wild mice. Yes. So I'm going to propose yes. to do that. It was yeah. highly risky, but yeah. they're out there. It's easy to catch them. Right. 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 It'd be so, very interesting to find them. Right. I'm sure we'll find something. Now, of course, that's exactly the kind of thing that would have been labeled as pork in the debate around the stimulus. <laughs> <laughs> you think John... Uh, John McCain would McCain. not have liked yes. it. Yes, Look they, at this. Looking for mice that get colds. What is this all about? All right. Dear, oh, dear. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we talked about that last week because yeah. he had been complaining, as yeah. you know, yeah. about this. Well, there used to be... I'm, I'm old enough to remember William Proxmire, who had his <laughs> Golden Fleece Award. <laughs> That's right. And I always thought that was appalling. Now, he's from the other side of the aisle. He was a sort of liberal Democrat. And he used to go out on these fishing expeditions for things that were yeah, that's right. bad. And uh, I always thought, you know, this is, this is not right. You know, fishing expeditions sometimes work. I hope we can do more of them. One of the most interesting is the sequencing of the ocean, right? Yes, yes. Well, that's a fishing expedition. It, sure was one. <laughs> it really is a fishing expedition. <laughs> <Right. laughs> but the data are incredible. Yeah. No, I know. I guess you don't you don't see viroids much in the press, right? They really don't come up much. I mean, you'd need one to to cause something pretty significant, or my beat extends to research. But you know, as you point out, there hasn't been uh, hasn't been an enormous amount yeah. recently with these, particularly in humans. The only way it would, I think, might hit the press is if you get uh, the equivalent of what's happening in Africa and actually in the Middle East now with stem wheat rust. Uh, which is causing devastation. This is a fungus, it's a rust, um, which would have a major impact on wheat stocks. So if you got a viroid that took out a major grain crop, it would probably make the news. Mm. In but fact, don't... last week, Dick wanted to talk about plant viruses. Mm -hmm. we, need, we didn't do it, but he said because they're impacting the, the world food oh, supply yes. Yes, they are. in a big way. Right. He was going to tell us about mm -hmm. that. So. We'll have them tell mm -hmm. us next. Mm -hmm. So those are regular mm -hmm. viruses, right? But yeah, right. So I mean, if you get you get a major plant epidemic, um, they may not do, they they may not do sort of epidemics. They may not be sort of epidemic like right. organisms. Well, they affect yield. Right, they affect yield, and that right. would impact on yes. But it's not hunger. like you're getting a wheat field where every, all, all the wheat collapses. Yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. It's very dramatic. You get field after field just wiped out. Okay, so let's move to our email. We always get reader uh -huh, email. Uh -huh. This is from Anthony. Dear Vincent and Dick, I'm a PhD student studying oncolytic viruses with John Bell in Ottawa, Canada. I just recently discovered your podcast and wanted to let you know I'm loving it. I'm, I know putting together a decent podcast can be time-consuming, and you guys are doing a great job. Also, thanks for giving oncolytic viruses some exposure. I believe the question of mechanism of tumor specificity came up, and although clearly much remains to be learned in this area, I would be remiss if I did not take the chance to make the point that a compromised innate immune system i.e. interferons, seems to be a distinguishing feature shared by many types of malignant disease. Perhaps this could even be a topic for future podcasts. So we had mentioned that we, we didn't understand why uh, viruses targeted tumors in general. But maybe if, if the tissue has a compromised innate system, that, that could do it. So that's a good point. Anyhow, anyhow, keep up the work. Great work. You're doing science a great service and really demonstrating the benefits the new media can offer. The new media. It's great. Right. Let's see, Mark writes, Hi, guys. Just a quick one to say I love the show. I'm a part-time postgraduate student in biomedical sciences, and I have to say I found it really easy to absorb and entertaining. I would really like if you could do a little section about mumps, as we are getting public health warnings here, Republic of Ireland, telling everyone to make sure they're vaccinated. I got struck down with the virus when I was a student despite being vaccinated and have a special interest because of that. It's a nasty dose, let me tell you. 
Far worse than the swelling in the neck was the 14 days waiting to be affected by the swelling in more sensitive masculine right. areas. Right. There is a certain level of anxiety there. In case you're interested, I've attached a link to the public announcements we are getting. As an observation, the figures they give are very short term since it was a long time ago I was vaccinated. I'm not sure how meaningful they are. The majority of those affected are in their late teens. So at a guess, I would say that either there was a defective batch of vaccine, a new vaccine is administered now, or there is a different strain of virus. Maybe I'm way off. I'll leave it to the experts. Let's see here. It's a story in the Irish Examiner. Despite a rise in the uptake of the vaccine against measles, mumps, and rubella, the number of mumps cases exceeded 1,300 at the end of 2008. Uh, uptake of the initial dose was 87% in right. 2007. So the uptake seems to be okay. Hmm? Well, the up, the uptake in 2007 was okay, but... What, these... what was it 15 years ago? Right. Yeah. What was it when the 15 to 24-year-olds right. uh, were... 60, right. They say 60% of the cases of mumps reported among 15 to 24-year-olds. Right. So what was the what was the coverage then? 15, 15 to 24 years ago. Right. So that's the age group of our writer, I presume. He's in college. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But he said he got vaccinated. Maybe it's worn off already. It could be it was, a, it was yeah. just not a very good vaccine. Um, I don't think the virus this changes. Is a, this is a Merck vaccine, the mumps vaccine? Uh, yeah, I think this is. Yeah, they do make the MMR. It might be theirs. Yeah. Unless it's manufactured in Europe. I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure about that. So it could be that it's not a long-lasting, but this is a live virus vaccine, so I would be surprised. Is or, there a is there an uptick in mumps in this country? It's it's never gone away, has it? There's been a rise in measles mm. in I know measles, yes, but this country and several others. Yeah, or well, several others because yeah. of the autism business. I mean, also that. Right, which would which would also have affected the mumps vaccine. Well, they t the the people yes, but the people who opted not to take it often opted to take single, you know, single um, vaccines, didn't they? Am I getting that muddled up with something else? Maybe I'm muddling that up with DPT. I think they opted out of the vaccine entirely. entirely. Okay. Sure. There isn't a single vaccine for MMR. I thought there was. I thought there was a... There might be, but I you don't... You mean monovalent? Yes, monovalent or... thing, vaccine. It's, it's all combined now, yeah. They aren't available. In they aren't available. Separately. But I think in Britain they might be. Hmm. So you would think that all three diseases... At least mumps would go up as well. Yes, yeah. I think so. But I haven't seen that. And rubella. I mean, that's, yeah. I mean, in some ways, rubella is the even more worrying. Yeah, because... That's a big problem, yeah. Uh, so here in this case, I would say that he, most likely is that he didn't take. He didn't, right. He, he didn't respond to I, the that vaccine. That would be the most likely, I think. So I would worry because a number of people don't uh, respond to vaccines because they're slightly immunocompromised. Right. And so at the uh, time of vaccination, for whatever reason, yeah, it can be temporary. So you see, he got mumps, and so now he should be protected because that's the right. best you can do. Well, the real question natural. is, should he be re-immunized for measles? Right, because measles is a very nasty disease, and I suspect as an adult, it's I don't know this, but as an adult, it might be even worse. Worse, yeah. So if he did, in fact, if he got either the mono or the the, the individual or the or the Three together, he should probably get re-immunized, yeah. yeah. I don't think they would bother to... Uh, rubella rubella's yeah. not an issue, but, but measles, it would, I mean, rubella's not a problem for him. But. Yeah. Incidentally, Mark, we're not giving specific um, medical advice here. Yes. Right. We, Hypothesized. We we're yeah. hypothesizing. We don't right. give medical advice. But you, because, uh, but you should probably ask your doctor whether... Right. <laughs> yes. If you hear this message, ask your doctor. Ask yeah, your doctor. Tell, oh. tell your doctor that you... Yeah. Uh, that you, you know, had mumps and you, had you mumps and you didn't get respond to the first vaccine. Should you get measles? Should you get measles yeah. vaccine again? Exactly, but that's what we think that you probably didn't respond because the the vaccine is probably fine. If there's a problem, then it would be known generally. You hear about that. Right. Megan writes, "Hello, Twiv. All right, this is the first of two emails because I screwed up last week, and we got two people picking it up. This is what I like about." This new media. When you make a mistake, it gets corrected. Right. Hello, Twiv. I love your podcast and look forward to listening to the new episode every Monday morning. Just wanted to make a comment about the EBV discussion from episode 23. Uh, EB, we did a story where EBV uh, was implicated in MS. Mm. There was yes. a seroprevalence study yes. done and looked like people with uh, MS were oh, more dear. likely to have antibodies to EBV. And okay. Dick said, well, once you get infected, what happens? And I said, well, you clear it and that's the end of it. 
But okay, that's wrong. <laughs> EBV is a gamma herpes virus and does have a latent stage, right. like that's other herpes viruses. Right. So she attached a link. Good, good, good. So I feel like once you get EBV, you get the mono. Right, and then then it's cleared, but the five. virus is there. Yeah, right. And then See, apparently, this is why we don't give specific medical advice? <laughs> oh, yes. We'd be sued left and right. Uh, the virus periodically gets reactivated, and you shed it, and that's how other people get Cut infected. It. Right. You don't have any more symptoms, but you know if you have, and it requires close contact. That's why they call it the kissing, kissing disease. disease. So oh. just don't kiss, and you'll be fine. <laughs> well, thanks for that. And then Everett wrote also. Uh, Everett, first off, the interview you recommended with Doctor Offit was absolutely phenomenal. I am too dazzled and disheartened by how many people I meet who still believe the autism hype. Secondly, I attached an article regarding EBV and MS. Right, okay. <laughs> the authors seem to indicate that EBV is, in fact, a lifelong infection that goes through periods of latency and reactivation. You have infinitely more academic ability to testify to the veracity of their study than I, but from my read, it seems compelling. Hey, you're absolutely right. We were wrong. Yeah. yeah. He he says, what would be the definitive way to test this? Take brain sections or immune cells of people with this condition and pass them on to someone else to see if they develop the same condition? It's a, it's latent in uh, lymphocytes, isn't it? That's yes. the source of latent. I yes. think it is. Yes. Yeah. So it's, I don't remember where I should remember. I think it's B lymphocytes. Yep, I believe it's B lymphocytes, right. right? All right, so one thing you could do is take a brain section and try and recover virus, but it's not likely you're going to have a fresh brain section it's also not human. likely that it's the, the the damage is probably immune, isn't it? It's, a, it's, it's thought a, to be an autoimmune so, so issue. It's, yes. So the virus isn't going to be in the right. It's it, the antibodies are going to be exactly right. okay. So I, I think, you, as we said last time, you need to uh, do some epidemiology to really prove that. And then it, the thing is, it would be nice to have an animal model to study it, but. As we said last time, we really don't have one. But the idea of recovering the virus, it won't prove the uh, etiology unless it duplicates the condition. So if you just recover virus from MS patients, it doesn't mean that right. it's caused right. I mean, the th that's been a That's been a, when I used to sit on NIH study sections, grants would come by trying to establish viral cause for MS on a regular basis. And there was always a hypothesis that it was virus X or virus Y or virus Z. Right. And they were usually based on fairly slender evidence. Well, with a virus that's so widespread like exactly. EBV, it's very difficult, very to, difficult establish to establish to causation. Right. As we said last time, your control population is crucial. And it doesn't exist. Or yeah. very small. It's very number. small. Okay. And then finally he said... I wanted to ask if, as a virologist, you could look at a set of data and infer the presence of a virus. Take the progressive inflammatory neuropathy in pork workers. One could assume that the use of air hoses started before 2006, and yet it had not been seen until relatively recently. Additionally, clusters of cases in scattered slaughterhouses arose more or less around the same time. So it would beg the question of whether or not the pigs themselves had a virus, or a prion, I suppose, in their CNS that triggered inflammatory response in humans. If it was the myelin itself, then wouldn't anyone who eats products with rendered brains also suffer the same condition? If you want to chill in your occipital, look up how many products have pork brains, by the way. <laughs> right. <laughs> Is this something you, being a virologist, can look at and think there has to be a virus here somewhere? I don't know if you remember this uh, story yeah. with the pork right. workers right. in a slaughterhouse right. in Iowa or somewhere. Uh, Minnesota. I don't yeah. remember yeah. exactly where. They got this inflammatory neuropathy. And in fact, initially, the epidemiology suggested it might be a virus. Yeah. And yeah. CDC went to investigate yeah. that. And I remember talking to one of my former students who works at CDC, and she said one of the suspects was a virus infection. So yes, when you have a cluster of cases in, a, in an area that seemed to be related in a certain way, it could be a virus infection. Uh, and this was when the people in the slaughterhouse, they use an air hose to blow right, the brains, the out. brains right, out of the right, skull. Right. And it aerosolizes, and you can imagine being infected. But it turns out that this is an uh, autoimmune reaction. Mm. They inhale the uh, pork brain, and they make an antibody. Right that, to it, which then cross-reacts yeah. with human. Yeah. So that's been shown. In fact, that was published not too long ago that this is what's happening to them. They've all recovered, by the way. It's not clear why they got it and no one else has seen it anywhere could be that was never reported. Who knows? This kind of farming and slaughtering, not farming, this kind of raising animals and slaughtering gets bigger and bigger every right. year. Right. right. So the likelihood that something... Yeah, industrial agriculture yep. has right. got a lot to answer for. But to answer your question, yes, you can look at certain um, outbreaks like this and, and 
and say, mm, it could mm. be a virus. And that's when you go in and you, you look. And in this case, they showed that it wasn't. Well, the Four Corners case. Mm -hmm. the, the, right. Where the um, sin nombre. Yes, virus, the hantavirus. Uh, hantavirus. That was a classic example of a whole bunch of people getting a similar disease. Right. And sending somebody in and discovering a virus. Yeah. So in that case, they found a virus. A virus, right. In this case, they looked. They didn't. Right. They found uh, that they had this neuropathy and uh, the antibodies were present. So. Right. All right. Thanks for your emails. We appreciate them. They really are interesting. Now, finally, we have our science picks of the week and our science blog of the week. I just discovered this one this week. It's called the weekly virus. The weekly virus. Yeah. It could almost be the cousin of this week in virology, but it is uh, a blog which it has a weekly entry on a specific virus. He includes basic information, taxonomy, structure, life cycle, interesting tidbits. And this is from a biochemistry undergraduate at Baylor University, currently doing research on plant viruses. Hmm. And he writes, it's his first science blog, and he hopes that maintaining it will provoke him into learning that which would have otherwise been overlooked, <laughs> which is great. Yes, that's great. You know, in yeah. fact, for my preparation for this trial, I did a blog post Wednesday on polio on the, the sequence of events, the timing, because I figured if I blogged about it, it would then stick in my head. Right. Right. And in fact, it was an important part of the uh, testimony. Hmm. So that is the weekly virus, and we'll have a link in the show notes. Our science podcast of the week is the NIH Research Radio Podcast. I don't know, have you seen this before, Alan? I have listened to a couple of, um, of snippets from it, yeah. I didn't realize the, the NIH has a 24-hour uh, radio show, which mm. is you, picked up by radio mm. stations over the country, right. which is meant to inform people what they're mm -hmm. doing mm -hmm. in terms of research at the NIH. Research, press conferences, health campaigns. So this is an excerpt of that. It's a it's a podcast they put together, uh, and you can listen to it. It's very well produced. I mean, it's I wouldn't think it's NIH. It's very slick with music all over the place, but, <laughs> but it has some good science in it. Hey, so you don't they, think they NIH is... <laughs> it's not a country organization. Huh? <laughs> yeah, I have a lot of money. Yeah. It's worth listening to. There is some some good science. If you want to know what it, what's going on at NIH at a reasonably understandable level, it's good. And finally, our science book of the week is called Ahead of the Curve, David Baltimore's Life in Science by Shane Crotty. Huh. Remember this book? Yeah, I, don't, I haven't seen that. So this is a book which was written. It's the biography of, yeah. of David Baltimore, who's a well-known virologist. It's written by Shane Crotty, who at the time was a graduate student at, at UCSF. Huh. And he did this in his spare time. He researched this book. And wrote it, and it's been published. It's been published a number of years ago now. Yes, did you, do you remember this book, I Alan? Don't, I don't. No, no, I don't know don't this at all. So it's quite good because David grew up around here, and you know, he has a lot of interesting things that's happened. It documents his scientific findings and so forth. This is a little self-serving, but there's a chapter in this book called Interlude. Uh, Hamish, turn to page 133. Oh, it's the it must be the, it's the, the sequence of polio virus. So he said, done by yeah me. <laughs> so he has this chapter where he says in nineteen so and so David uh, postdoc in David's lab determined <laughs> the sequence of polio, and then he says here's all the information you need to make a polio virus, and he just yeah. lists the entire sequence. sequence. <laughs> so it's a chapter in the book called Interlude. Oh, it's very clever. I and, like that. Uh, I thought it was cute. Yeah. He, so that's uh, Head of the Curve. It's a nice uh, biography of David Bolton. So those are our picks of the week. Don't re forget, you can find other science podcasts at sciencepodcasters.org and promednetwork.com. These are two places on the web that collect podcasts, and we're part of that. Don't forget, TWIV will be at the ASM General Meeting in Philadelphia on May 19th, 2 p.m. Myself, Alan, and Dick will be there. We'll do a live TWIV www.asm.org will have meeting details. Come by and watch us, or we're going to be streaming it live over the internet. You can watch the streaming video, maybe of us making fools of ourselves, right, Alan? Quite likely. Continue to send us your questions. Uh, twiv at twiv.tv. We love to hear what you think or what you would like to know. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Hamish, thank you for joining us. I'm delighted to be here. Hope you will return. I would be honored to do so. Excellent. We will be back next week. I don't know who will be with us, but we'll be there. I have a few interesting people lined up, so stay with us. Subscribe to us in iTunes so you will 
automatically get every weekly episode. Thanks again for listening. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>